Hello to the ladies and men and non-binary friends. My name is Kai, Mr. Whittle still won't watch Promare, and you're listening to the 5th Period Podcast. Hello everyone and welcome back to 5th Period, the film podcast hosted by two media teachers. We're at this rate, we're going to run out of Senor Spielbergo films by the end of the year. My name is Mr. Brown and with me as always is... Mr. Whittle, your accomplice on this journey back to the 80s. Mm. We are of course talking about E.T. This is our fourth Spielberg film on the podcast this year. Agreed. Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Yeah. Then Hook. Yeah. Jurassic Park. Yeah. And now E.T. I mean, these films do tend to appeal to a wide audience. And Spielberg does try and make his films accessible by not having anything that puts it into uh, a rating territory that we can't explore. They're usually GLPG. That's actually been one of the big things. Yeah, we're we're trying to look at a lot of what people would consider to be classic films, Mm. widely regarded in a very positive light. Spielberg ticks both of those boxes. Great films, but they're also kid-friendly. Yeah. If you do want to check out any of those previous podcasts on the other Spielberg films, you can look at the Fifth Period podcast playlist on my channel. While you're there, just have a bit of a browse and throw around some some likes. But most importantly, make sure you are subscribing so that you uh, can stay up to date with any future releases. I saw you were tinkering with uh, YouTube Shorts on your channel. I was. I've been experimenting quite a bit this year, just kind of playing around with algorithms. I've got YouTube Studio. I'm just... I have a real fascination with how it works yeah. in terms of how you reach different audiences, what makes something pop up on people's feed. Because they are shorter videos, you're a lot more tempted to go, oh yeah, I'll have a look at what that is and then kind of scan away. So. I was curious to see what would happen if I changed a previous video that I had into a short video. I am still tinkering with that, but I'm interested to see. Point being, if uh, you subscribe, you might see um, Mr. Brown's shorts. (laughs) Nice. Yes. In addition to our main discussion of E.T., the very extraterrestrial today, we will be doing a student appreciation and regular weekly watches and tantalizing trailers segments. So if you want to jump to your favorite moments, I will leave time codes in the description below. Do we have a student appreciation to... We do have yes. a student appreciation. I have to give big props to Kai. Hey, Kai. Uh, so no phoning it in from him. He has a voice made for radio, I would say. Yes. Very, very charismatic intro to today's episode. And he even included some sweet, sweet rhymes in the mix. He was very considerate of what he wanted to give us for his intro prior to pressing record. Yes, I believe he'd rehearsed it a couple of times over, so he was ready to go. I was actually really surprised we hadn't had Kai on to do an intro before. I mean, he's been a big player at Film Club both this year and last year as well. Mm-hmm. Yep. But he'd been holding out just in case we did Promare, which, as his intro suggests, still hasn't happened. <laughs> With only one more animated feature before Kai graduates, I don't think it's looking good. Uh, no. (laughs) I mean, got hop competition as to some other people I want to placate the uh, requests. Yes. Wow, look, I teach Kai for Year 12 Media, so I'm sure he's going to be reminding me every class. Especially now that I've said that it's still an outside op, but he'd have to fight up with Daria and Barbie and stuff like that. That's true. Yes, plus there's been a big, big request for Cars 2. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think we'll be lost watching Cars 2 because I've never seen Cars 1. (laughs) My understanding is they're pretty tricky to follow. You've never entered the Cars universe? I have not entered the Cars universe, and I'm okay with it. Yeah, anyway. Alrighty, let's jump in. (laughs) In terms of Spielberg, recently we were starting to rank our Spielberg films. Mm. So you and I both have Letterboxd accounts and you sent me a link to a brand new list that you'd made where you ordered the the 19 of how many Spielberg films? 35. So this was in fact uh, inspired by looking at through the year, noticing that we have done a bunch of Spielberg films. I'm like, okay, well the four that we've done this year... Plus, we actually did a couple last year that we didn't record podcasts for, but they were played in film club. So, yeah, I decided to go and rank, well, first determine how many of all these films I've seen, and then based on what I had seen, rank them. So, Jaws came in at number one for me, but E.T. is a close second. So, Mm. well, I wouldn't say a close second, but it's it's, it's second. (laughs) Whereas you had... 
Uh, well, it's interesting because it turns out I've seen exactly 19 as well. A different 19 to the ones that you've seen. Probably no surprise to the listeners to hear that uh, Indiana Jones was, was ranked at the top of my list. Both uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark and The Last Crusade. But I also have Jaws very, very uh, closely following those two. So... Yeah, I mean, I, I adore Jaws. I recently moved it into some of my all-time favorite films. Mm. Spielberg certainly, I would say he's more hits and misses. Mm. Um, I think out of the 19, there's probably, say, the bottom five or so. I wouldn't want to revisit, but the, the rest, yeah, great films. Yeah. Yeah. E.T. the <laughs> extraterrestrial. Now, I want to, like, I've got a couple of nice little trivia bits uh, oh, yeah? for the, throughout the whole film. Something when you and I were talking about this film and we're talking about other Spielberg films was we brought up uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And mm. you mentioned <laughs> that wouldn't it be cool if they had made it so that this was kind of a sequel to Close Encounters? Well, maybe it is. I'm yeah, sure there's I, fan theories so, out there. So, in fact, Spielberg is said to have gotten the idea from uh, the end of that film, Close Encounters, which, by the way, I think I had it in my top five, at least in my top eight. It's one of my favorites for sure. Richard Dreyfuss is just great. So when the aliens, spoiler alert on Close Encounters and on E.T. in general, there's an alien in it. <laughs> um, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. <laughs> there's aliens that show up at the end of it. And Spielberg wondered what it would happen if one of those aliens stuck around on Earth. And this is meant yeah. to be the inspiration point for writing E.T. That and a few other things. It also came from a story he wrote as a kid which then got worked into another story. So, you know, this is what a filmmaker like Spielberg does. He draws on various things to kind of come into an idea. And we all know that good filmmaking is usually a collaborative effort. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, a lot of reasons why, to me, it seemed like it would be such a good fit is that this story just jumps straight in. Mm. We don't see the ship land or anything. It's just there at the start of the film. Plus, there's already this established government agency that's looking out for it. Like, yep. there's so much of the world building that doesn't happen. There's just a lot you have to go, okay, that's just I, going on. I had the same thought. It's like straight away we're into that action. And it makes me wonder, like, this film, if someone at a studio wasn't saying, no, it needs to fit into it two hours or less, mm. would Spielberg of today, if Netflix just gave him the blank check, <laughs> Just have a three-hour version of E.T. where we have to see the ship land. We have to hear the backstory of all the aliens, all that kind of stuff. I wonder how much story or even footage got left on the, the editing floor because they wanted to have that pace and momentum considered. Well, on that note, did you watch the hour 45 version? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, so I watched one hour 54. Okay. And... I looked into it afterwards because I was like, oh, I was I'm sure this was an hour 45 when we were watching it in a film club. And I looked into it and realized that there's like an extended director's cut version. Mm. But what was confusing was the extended director's cut version is supposed to be the version where they've got updated visual effects in it and they've like modified parts of the film. And I didn't have any of that, thankfully, because I don't really want to see a CG version of E.T. Oh, so there's... A you maybe saw an extended version that didn't have the enhanced kind of look. Yeah. Because Spielberg agreed to the enhanced look, but then backtracked about 10 years later and said, I don't want this anymore. Go right. back to the original. So maybe they've done like a compromise where it's got the extra scenes maybe, in it. Maybe, yeah. But it doesn't have the visual effects. Yeah. Because... Yeah, I, I thankfully just got the puppet version of E.T. There was no weird CG version of it. Yeah, no. Unlike George Lucas, Spielberg was happy to eat his words and backtrack on the decision to, you know, enhancing your, your old films. The DVD release that initially came out had the CGI version. Mm -hmm. But then, yeah, like 10 years later, he said, get rid of that. So the only way to get that version is if you get a copy of that original DVD, like right. I think 2002. There, there, there is various versions out there. Right. I didn't know that that would have been out there though i would have actually liked to seen that did you notice uh that one was on stan right it, it's hard to know like what are the extra scenes or because it had been so yeah. long since i'd seen the unless you've watched the movie like 10 times over like yeah those extra scenes wouldn't stand out to you would they no yeah. and this was one that um i said this to you earlier today it was very much like hook in that when i was a kid I'd seen this quite a few times, but it was never one where I was like, oh, I love E.T. It's such a good movie. Yeah. Um, I quite enjoyed watching it last night, which we know wasn't the case for Hook. <laughs> but yeah, I, I still don't think I would rank this amongst my, my favorite Spielberg. But yeah. There's something about, and I, I was trying really hard to think of the words for this. The way the film looks 
and the way he chooses to film a conversation, any kind of dialogue interaction, there's something really interesting about it where it's got a unique feel to it that his earlier films had and then later films kind of went more into the generic kind of vibe that I'm talking about. But that was a big part of the appeal to me. Not the only part. There's a bunch of stuff that I like. But um, yeah, that, that was a big appeal for me. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And look, as, as I said, I, I quite enjoyed watching this last night, but I probably wouldn't revisit again for a while now. Yeah. I do like that the start of the film, it's just got that black screen. It's got an eerie kind of noise to it. We do see John Williams' name come up as the, the composer for the film, but... I will say, like anyone who's been listening to the podcast previous episodes know that knows that I'm not a fan of his score. Um, this one is pretty good. This one doesn't sit on the nose so much for me as some others. There are points where I'm like, I think he's overdoing it, but <laughs> generally speaking, it's fine. But the, the way the film starts where it's kind of got this, here's uh, the credits and then let's go. And then we're in that forest. Mm. Yeah. The music is very, very eerie. And I love how you don't see the creatures fully for quite a bit of the film. Like, they conceal what they look like for a while. It's always like a really long, shadowy kind of shot. One thing that I think Spielberg does through all of his films is really use lighting to strong effect. And this opening scene is no exception. It reminded me of how they start Jurassic Park as well and Close Encounters and, like, all the films where he's using lighting in a practical sense, but still really setting mood. That kind of spookiness of the forest is set and like really using the car headlights and then the, the lights from the spaceship to set uh, an eeriness to the, the environment. Yeah. We see the aliens, I guess, exploring. So yeah, they're, they're, my, I labeled them as horticulturalists. Right. Because right. they've got their little garden that we see in the ship as well. They're going around and they're picking plants, plants. and then you know they're, they're clearly fans of like plants. I thought of them instantly. They're kind of set up as like old hippies that are just like <laughs> like these flowers are cool, man. Well, they <laughs> they do have a connection to to the plants. Like anytime ET is unwell, the the flower wilts. Symbolism, am I right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, even when E.T. goes astray from the rest of his group, he's looking up at the, the, the tops of the trees and we, we, we see from his perspective, like, how tall the trees are mm. and he's got this wonder um, to it, uh, in the way he's looking at them. So we clearly see that he is a fan of nature and mm. then, yeah, we get that his whole pack is as well. Yeah, and I like they often put you in his perspective. Sometimes they do it with POV camera. Even when he gets chased through the forest at the start, it's like that Evil Dead shot where it's like running, through, that as the, well, yeah. running through the uh, the tracking POV shot through well, the Well, I can woods. jump to another fact. That maybe oh, you know about this one. Um, Spielberg deliberately had most of the camera shots from a child's perspective. Ah, that's cool. So I, th I thought that was really cool. Like, And like it wasn't until halfway through the film that I uh, Googled that fact. I'm like... Yeah, I could see that. Like mm. he, in, he really tried all shots to be at a child's eye level. So a lot of time looking up at the adults, being eye level with ET, because obviously ET is as short as the, the the kids. That's that's very very cool. Yeah. The ship that he's on ends up leaving because the government agents kind of close in on it, and so they flee. And it's super sad. ET gets left behind. At this point, they've shown you a close-up of him. And he's very cute, like, especially when he's running through the forest. So when he gets left behind, you do instantly feel really, really sad for him. Like, you empathize with him very quickly in the film. That's another thing where it's an alien, right? And, mm. like, we're meant to, especially in 1982, not really know what we think about aliens, whether we're meant to empathize or see them as an other. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love how quickly we're on E.T.'s side. Yeah. Yeah. He does a good job of just making him adorable. Mm -hmm. It's like Wally. -E. We love Wally. -E yeah. Because he's cute. Yep. Yeah, as I said, they don't really establish who the government people are. And the character Keys, yes. who is named because in maybe 90% of the film, he's just, it's a waste shot of keys on his belt. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. <laughs> I just, it's to me confusing that they establish his character so early on and then every time they bring him back, they're like, here's the key. So it's the same guy. But there's no sort of big reveal when he comes into it. It's not like, oh my God, it was that person. So I don't really know the purpose of concealing his identity for so long. 
Yeah, I, like, as he eventually becomes the one who empathizes with Elliot. Exactly. And, he's and, not like, even an ominous, threatening no, no, character. No, he, no, he's on Elliot's side in a way. The only justification for that character that came to mind was that Spielberg wanted an adult view into the world as well that isn't opposing what the child's trying to achieve. So. But we don't know that for so much of it. Because no. Keyes is just tied in with this big agency. Yes. And so, it, yeah, it's, it's interesting that... They decide to conceal it for something that when he is finally introduced, it's not like a, a massive moment. He's True. just another one of the people. Yes. Then we skip away to uh, Elliot and his family. We get introduced to Michael. We get introduced to his mum, who's the character from Cujo. I'll call it out now. She is best on ground for me. Really? Yeah, I love Dee Wallace. Okay. Uh, I think she is hard done by, by not being in many other films. Like, as this was her biggest film. She's in Cujo. She's great in Cujo. Yeah, uh, she's in two other horror films and one of them came to mind that I'm like, oh, Lucky likes that film. Something old. But um, yeah. Uh, Something old. Dee Wallace, I absolutely adore her. You know, when she becomes likable to me, this is a bit later, but Elliot calls his brother penis breath. Oh my God, I've and got this she note. she laughs as he's telling her off. Yep. <laughs> like, I loved her for that. Like, I mean, that's obviously a directorial kind of thing, but the way she delivers it as well, it's so sincere because like that would be funny. Of course. If your kid's saying that, right? Yeah, well, it's kind of like if someone insults someone in one of our classes using a funny insult. Yeah. We have to kind of compose ourselves <laughs> to tell them off yeah. because we're like, that, that's pretty funny. Yeah, so I thought uh, The uh, Howling, she was in The Howling. Do you know that one? I have seen The Howling, 81 yeah. horror film, yeah. Yeah, it's, anyway. a, it's just all right. Yep. Yeah. Um, but I reckon she's great in this. She stands yeah. out every scene. And she scene, might be great awesome. in that too, just yeah. the film's all right. Okay, great. Yeah. His brother is playing Dungeons and Dragons with his friends and this was first of many inspirations for Stranger Things. Great that you bring it up. Stranger Things is very much premised on a gang working together rather than just Elliot and co or mm -hmm. like protagonists and others. But it reminded me that Stranger Things called upon E.T. as well as a bunch of other films from the 80s. But E.T. influence is so there. Oh, yeah. Especially with the bikes later on. The, yeah, yeah, I mean, the, the era, the bikes, the yeah. fact that there's strange science fiction-y creatures, yep. the government agents that are in big suits, like... Yeah. It's all E.T., really. This was such a big inspiration for Stranger Things. Absolutely, yep. There's this great shot where Elliot goes outside. All the fog is coming out of the So shed, good. And you've got the moon in the background. Yeah. It, it's an awesome shot, but clearly Spielberg thought it was an awesome shot too because we see it about 20 times in the <laughs> film. Like that exact shot yes. in the backyard yep. gets reused quite a lot. He runs back into the house and he says that there's something in there and they all go out. And of course, by this time he's vanished. So no one believes him. How old do you reckon Elliot's meant to be in this film? I didn't look it up like an eight or a nine. I'm not 100% sure, but I've got a few kind of notes along the way where I'm like, I don't know if these characters would do that yeah. at the age that they are. So th th that's what I was going to speak to where Elliot, I think I, I believe it in terms of Elliot it strikes a really good balance of fear of the unknown of E.T., but also curiosity, which allows mm -hmm. him to not just run away. So his bravery in terms of confronting such a crazy situation is pretty impressive. There's a balance of curiosity, but fear as well. Yeah, and there's times in this film where Henry Thomas absolutely shines with his acting performance mm. but there's other times where i'm like oh maybe that was a bit too much or maybe that was a little bit of a silly reaction okay. or, yep. and shortly after this he goes back out to investigate and he's in the cornfield and he sees et face to face and as he screams out there's like six or seven cuts the editing right yeah, 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 yeah. and i i wondered i mean you could do this for multiple reasons is it to show how hectic and crazy the situation is or was it perhaps to kind of blend some exaggerated screaming oh, yes. acting kind of stuff because yeah. sometimes they do that in films if, it, if a kid can't quite nail the reaction they use strategic camera shots and editing to kind of mask that a little bit there's a lot of anecdotes going around as to how spielberg worked around working with child actors on this film more of it's around working with drew barrymore who plays the younger sister see she's best on ground for me she's very good she's yeah, awesome. yeah yeah um but uh, yeah, there was a couple of hiccups where Spielberg had some workarounds. 
I really like the character of Gertie. She's yeah. really, really good. Yeah. So Elliot ends up scaring off E.T. with his scream. And so he goes out and he leaves Skittles for him to lure him back in. Uh, Reese's Pieces. Reese's Puffs, Reese's Puffs. Eat them up, beat them up, beat them up, beat them up. Oh, sorry. Reese's they weren't allowed pieces. to use Skittles. They wanted to use Skittles. Right. So uh, there's, there's a whole thing about um, product placement that comes into this. Oh, no kidding. It's product, everywhere. Product placement. They went to the Mars company and said they wanted to use, oh, not Skittles, sorry, M&Ms. And Mars said no at the time, much to their silliness, because they, they just go, okay, well, we'll just use Reese's Pieces instead. And Reese's Pieces sales skyrocket. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so um, do they make it clear that it's Reese's Pieces? I only film? know because it's a bright orange packet. And right. bright orange packet, that was Reese's Pieces. Because, yeah. I mean, the other things, there's no beating around the bush. Here's Coke yes, and yeah. this kind of beer. Yeah. And there's a lot of product placement. Also, uh, lots of love for, for George Lucas, his, his old pal George Lucas. The Star Wars references are everywhere. Yes, they're, they're, there's a, there's, and they're not subtle. <laughs> no, they're not. Uh, there's a there's a bit of back and forth that because these guys are all coming from the same growing up through Hollywood together, Spielberg and Lucas. And while we're talking Easter eggs and placements, Elvis Costello, musician Elvis Costello, mm. uh, he's one of the posters on the wall in Elliot's bedroom. But the the couple of lyrics that you hear Michael singing as he goes to the fridge oh, yeah. uh, is the song Accidents Will Happen by Elvis Costello, which there is my favourite Elvis Costello song. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to ask you, uh, this is a music question for you. So... When Elliot goes out and leaves the Reese's Pieces for E.T., mm. and you get this sort of like investigative, mysterious track when he's on his bike, did that remind you of anything? Ooh, uh, jogging the memory. I know the scene you're referring to. I can't recall the music, though. I've got one that I've prepared earlier. Oh, now, very good. I don't, I don't think the songs actually sound like the same tune, but it just the kinds of notes and the instrumental qualities that were in them it really, really reminds me. Wait, wait, me so of are you going to play me the original first? Yes. Yes, cool. All right, so this is the original first. Okay, I all got right. it. <laughs> all right. So, so for those of you uh, listening, the look I just gave Mr. Brown across the table as he played it, I'm like, I think I know. It was a look of excitement, <laughs> so that makes me pretty confident you know what, what I'm going to play next. Yes, yep. That's what you were yep, thinking? Yep. All right, so North by Northwest yes. is the second theme. We fanboyed over North by Northwest and the music, especially when we were doing that podcast. Yep. And as soon as I heard that last night, I That's got cool. such strong yeah. North by Northwest vibes. Yeah. Yep, so maybe that was a little nod from Williams. Very, very catchy tune. Yeah. He does lure E.T. back. What I didn't understand is that he's using the Reese's Pieces as lure for him. Mm -hmm. And he manages to get him into his bedroom using the Reese's Pieces as well. Because E.T. brings some back That's what I don't when he's understand. at home, right? Yeah. If they work as sort of bait, why is E.T. giving has, them back has to Has he him? saved some for later or something? Maybe. Although, oh, now we're getting really technical <laughs> into it. <laughs> the, the pile that E.T. puts on Elliot's lap mm -hmm. is multicolored, which Reese's Pieces aren't. They're, di they're like three or four different colors, but they're like variants of oranges this and browns. So maybe those are M&Ms or Skittles. But that's why I thought yeah, they were yeah, Skittles. Yeah, yeah, they no, look a lot like Because they, they were multicolored, but then what Elliot's using when he goes into the forest is very much Reese's Pieces, and the internet's confirmed this. But yeah, maybe there are Skittles or M&Ms. So you think he's he's outsourced different candy from somewhere else and he's now giving that as a Well, Elliot's gone back. with the Reese's Pieces and then, yeah, E.T.'s gone, I'll up, I'll up the ante and just go, I'll go source some different candy. Yeah, wow, yeah. I'd rather Skittles to Reese's Pieces person. No, I'd go to the Reese's Pieces any okay, day. Yeah, fair enough. Peanuts all the way. Is this when they're sitting around the table at, at dinner? This is when the penis breath line yes. comes, I'm yep. pretty sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's nothing like that, penis breath, Elliot. <laughs> Quality line. Yeah. Michael, they work really hard in the film to establish that Michael's a jerk, hey? Yes. Yeah. Oh, 
do you think I don't think of him as Joe because he's defensive of his mom when she's offended about the the dad Mexico thing. So he's not full jerk. He blames them for upsetting her in that instance. Yeah, even like, though he's probably a bigger cause of upsetting her. Absolutely. So he does have that teen ignorance as to obviously Elliot and Gertie didn't mean to upset yeah. um, the mum. Yeah, he's the older sibling. I thought he would have more awareness of the fact that his mum is recently single. He's looking out for her, but he's also, he should be taking on like that mentor role for the other yeah. um, siblings. I, I get the vibes like he's in that 13, 14 year old stage. And look, now that you bring it up, like this part of the film, the mum, I, I don't know her name. I don't uh, know her the... name is Mary. Mary. Because they refer to her as Mary the whole time. So disrespectful, those kids. <laughs> um, Mary is set up as yeah a recently divorced single mum dad's gone to mexico though it comes across like that's just the story the kids have been told you can't visit him he's in mexico yeah, yeah, yeah. uh this resonated with me because my parents split up when i was about 12 so like that really connected with me and also spielberg part of him writing this was his parents broke up at around the same time if anyone has watched right. meet the fablemans um is that what the film's called not meet the fablemans because i'm getting mixed up with meet the fuckers i think uh, i think it's just called the, the fablemans. fablemans yeah yeah, yeah. Um, which is his most recent film which is very autobiographical in many elements ah, cool. um it does touch on his parents as well um a lot of spielberg's films kind of traversing his own childhood mm. and this is no exception we see how much mary is struggling just to keep control of the yeah. kids throughout the film. But yeah, it's just like Elliot did the setting of the table. Gertie did it like for breakfast that morning. Michael's just like, no, nope, I'm not doing anything. You yeah. guys can take care of it. Not disputing the fact that many things he does are jerky for sure. Then we get another shot of the ominous key man out in the forest. And whether they're Skittles, whether they're Reese's Pieces, <laughs> he decides to pick them up off the forest floor and eat them. Yep. Why would you do that? No, oh, it's the 80s. Things the 80s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Skittles grew on trees out in the forest. <laughs> Maybe that's where E.T. found them to bring them back. It's <laughs> the <a> Skittle tree. <laughs> uh, but because E.T. is back at the house now, Elliot pulls a sickie. Meanwhile, Michael is backing the car down the driveway. Yes. So He's these only kids, practicing reverse, though. These kids are out of control. <laughs> Gertie even rats him out, but the mum's like, oh, I know, but I can't do anything unless I catch him in the act. <laughs> I thought it was interesting Mary leaving Elliot at home by himself. He seemed almost too young for that. Yeah, but like more uh, sincere in this comment, it was the 80s. Like we, yeah. like I, I remember being allowed to be home at a much younger age than I think commonly what parents would allow these days. Plus, uh, I don't know, like we haven't really talked about the setting, which is like in the San Fernando Valley, right in somewhere in California, like Northern California. We noticed they're at the back of a court the houses are relatively modern and then there's a few scenes where um especially towards the end the kids are riding through half developed yeah. houses and stuff it's a newer suburb where mm -hmm. maybe there's an assumption that it's a safe neighborhood that outside of aliens in the yeah. forest nearby but yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and keys that's it oh those ominous <laughs> ominous keys yeah this is when Elliot introduces him to all the brands that endorsed the film. So, uh, and then Coke paid yeah. for the, the <laughs> yeah. new camera rig that yes. we've got. Yep. It's interesting too, like, that they've got a few Star Wars references because in quite a lot of the Star Wars prequel films, I'm pretty sure they've put a CG version of E.T. I, I did read that at least one of them has, like, E.T. as one of the representations of, like, aliens in one of the worlds. Yeah. 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 The kids found it really hard when they were in a scene with the puppet of E.T., to look at him as if to make eye contact through conversation. So the direction was that they are to just look at one of his eyes because his eyes are too spread right. apart. So they, they couldn't, they looked like they weren't looking at him properly. I so, see. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, there you go, I see. I yeah, see, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I did also have a note. Who do you think has bigger eyes, E.T. or Elliot when he gets shocked? <laughs> as he's setting up things in the house or going to get him some food or whatever, we hear for the very first time, first of three times, I'll be right here, the mm. iconic line. Yep. And he just sort of says it casually because he's like, I'll be right here, just just stay. It comes up, uh, yeah, another two times later on. And obviously it's it's one of the, the big lines from the film that people always quote. Like bringing up that point around how Elliot will say a line and then obviously later E.T. parrots it um, 
within a different context. It reminded me of Iron Giant. Oh, yeah? Um, yeah, like, obviously, those two characters are the same. And that's probably just a general trope that's set up in these films where there's an outsider who's accepted by the protagonist and the protagonist is kind of in defense of them, whatever. There's probably a bunch of films like this. Have you seen Big Hero 6? No, I it's know. It's an animated film. Yeah, so. but I, I've heard good things about <laughs> it's it. really yeah, good, yeah. yeah. Um, but that's the same sort of thing. Like, yeah. he teaches him his own routines and his own, like, expressions and stuff like that, and then he learns them back. Yeah. Yeah, fist bump. Fist bump. <laughs> it's, yeah, that's a really good film. Yep. I love the scene where Michael comes home and then Gertie comes into the room and they all meet E.T. and they're all just screaming and it's going It's very great. cool. It's, like, it's yeah, very fun. The, the way that, like, I, I, I like that part of how characters other than Elliot eventually meet E.T. Like, because mm. um, the mom obviously later meets him as well. Oh, I just used the word him. E.T. is meant to be genderless. So oh, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll probably default to saying he. Well, Gertie at one point asks... And Elliot says, yes, it's a he. Oh, right. And Elliot refers to him okay. as he, the whole film. So Because one of the trivia points that I read was at least Spielberg intended for E.T. to be genderless. Which he very well may be, yeah. but Elliot can be just making an assumption. Yeah, he also yeah, doesn't yeah. like it when Gertie dresses E.T. up as a girl <laughs> later on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he, he's a young kid. And E.T. is not meant to be a direct replacement for Elliot's dad, but there's certainly that assumption that E.T. is in some way replacing the whole that the separated right, yeah, dads. the whole for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Certainly not the role, though. No. <laughs> That'd be a weird dad. <laughs> we then get the awesome shot of the full town and it does the dolly zoom and the town kind of stretches. It's like back to the government agents. We know Key Man's there because we see those keys again. Yeah. Phew. But it does, do, I don't know if you noticed the dolly zoom. No. So the whole town warps because they do like a really cool establishing shot I and then use it. a dolly zoom to make it stretch further away. Oh, cool. It feels very ominous too because they're kind of standing in the foreground and the town's in the background and then it stretches. Right. Mary asks Gert, where are you going? I'm going to play in Elliot's room. Okay, bye, Mary. <laughs> Just like the unnatural way that she says that line. It's so perfect to depict kids thinking they're getting away with yeah, something. Yeah, the manipulation has worked. Yeah. Yeah, 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 the lie. Yeah. We find out that E.T. has telekinesis. Mm. Flying balls everywhere. Yes. That's probably one of the effects that looks a little janky in the film. Yeah, um... Anything that's a superimposed image, it did come to mind. I'm going to jump ahead and talk about the bike flying later on. Mm -hmm. Technology hadn't jumped a lot since Mary Poppins was in the sky. Mm. It looked, like you said, janky. Oh, yeah, it looks, it looks very janky. But for something like this, like the balls or later on when he's making the comms to call home, I don't know that it needed to be CG or to be mm. superimposed on it. I feel like at that point they could have still used tricks like wires and things like that so um, and i wonder if it's just like oh we can do this cool technological thing let's do it spielberg did exactly that okay, uh, right. a, lo a lot of the um the trick imagery initially was set up to be stop motion stuff and he then decided that didn't look realistic enough so right. he went for the technology that he used obviously in hindsight well you know, the years haven't been kind to it, but I'm sure at the time, like, it was pretty impressive. Mm. Yeah, something we haven't talked about is how popular this film was. A little bit of trivia. Okay. This film trumped Star Wars at the box office to be the biggest box office grossing hit of all time at the time. So there's been three films that have trumped it since, but mm -hmm. only two directors, one of them being Spielberg. What are the other three? What, what are the three that came after E.T. that... Trumped it. At the box office. At the box office. Highest grossing films of all time. Oh, Is Avatar one of them? Avatar is the most recent. So then, Wait, did you say two by the same director? Yes. Titanic? Yes. Okay. So, and then the other one's Spielberg. I don't know the order of when Spielberg's films were released. So that's well, probably going to throw me off a little bit. It was after E.T. but before Titanic. But this was post-Jurassic Park, right? No, Jurassic Park is it. Oh, okay, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So E.T. 1982. Mm -hmm. At the time, biggest grocer... And then Jurassic Park trumped it. So Spielberg trumped his own record whenever Jurassic Park was, 93, 94, whenever we, like, yeah, thereabouts. Titanic, James Cameron, 98, and then Avatar, 2009. Spielberg and Cameron. That's interesting. <laughs> no, sure it, it is. Half of this conversation will be trimmed. Well, you're certainly on the pause to say. Um, 
I got a question for you. Go. The kids that are friends with Michael. Yes. Are we supposed to like them or not like them? Uh, like them as much as Elliot would like them, if that makes sense. Like your okay. older brother's mates. Mm-hmm. I don't know. You've got an older brother. I don't. I can really sympathize with Elliot at the start of the film where he's like, can I join in? Yeah. Play? I totally would do that Like when my brother's friends and stuff were over when I was younger. Yeah. But like when they're waiting for the bus, they're like, oh, did you find the creature? And he's like, oh, he's a spaceman. Oh, where's he from? Uranus? Did you get it? Did you get Uranus? it, Uranus? Yeah, he, just... he doesn't get it, Ty. And so he just repeats it over and over. I, I did like that little interaction. Where's he from? Uranus? Get it? Your anus? He doesn't get it, Ty. Get it? Your he doesn't get it. It's so I loved it. So Elliot goes off to school and E.T. stays home, walking around in a robe. He's hanging out with a dog, eating some potato salad and drinking beer. And all I could think was that sounds like a perfect way to spend a day. <laughs> Just hanging out with a dog, done. Watching TV, yep. yeah. But this is when they quite obviously show that there is a strong connection between the two of them. Mm. As E.T. drinks beer, Elliot gets drunk. His drunk face when he's at school, it was so good. Yeah. I love this sequence. It's it's hilarious. I like that it's what happens afterwards that I find a bit weird. The frog stuff. Okay. Yeah. So this whole sequence to me, like even though I really like showing the link between them, I'm not sure why there's a link. I'm not sure what the link is. At first he's linked to him, but then he's linked to what he's watching on TV. It's all just a bit strange and bizarre and i don't know why he goes or release the frogs et's not in that situation i like the idea of setting elliot up as someone who is sympathetic to creatures that are held captive Mm -hmm. and you know obviously later on that becomes relevant but we didn't like there's this whole ballet that occurs almost the music is very much orchestra playing like the release of the frogs out the window and like it's all very odd. And then it's meant to tie in with whatever E.T. is watching on the TV as well. It's love but interest. Only for, like, the, for the kiss at the end. Yeah, but like, and... why did we need that? Like, in terms of character development of Elliot, like, do we need him to have a love interest? Because that character no. doesn't come back <laughs> at any stage. Yeah, I wouldn't even say she is a love interest. No. She's only in that one scene, and he doesn't seem to show that much interest. Although the class seems to be behind him getting the kiss, because that kid slides in to bring Elliot up so he could step on the kid so he's at level with the girl. It's so all it's, very peculiar to me. It's very strange. But she's into it too. We yeah. get that, that shot of her foot afterwards twitching to yeah. show that it was a good kiss. <laughs> <laughs> Trivia bit for this. Okay. It wouldn't be a fifth period podcast if we did not mention one Harrison Ford. I love you. I know. Please. Are you aware that he was actually on the cutting room floor of this film? I was not. So they filmed a scene where he's the headmaster. You're a, a teacher? Part time. So Harrison Ford obviously had worked with Spielberg on Raiders at this point. They had actually been together while Spielberg was writing E.T. He was filming Raiders. Right. E.T. was co-written by Melissa Matheson, who was Harrison Ford's girlfriend at the time, later his wife. So there's that connection as well. But Harrison Ford was actually in this film, but he didn't make the cut, which Ooh. sounds about right to me. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say, you must be relieved. <laughs> well, I'm just upset that once they did the extended cut of the film, they he didn't still didn't make scene. the 10-minute yeah. extras. <laughs> While all of this is going on at school and obviously Elliot gets in trouble for being drunk, Gertie gets to spend a bit of time with E.T. She dresses him, but Gertie also teaches him how to talk. How good is that scene prior where Mary just avoids seeing E.T. in the kitchen? Gertie wants, like, meet E.T. Yeah, Yeah, basically. She's just, like, ignorant to it all. It's like later when she meets him and she kind of laughs it off at first. Yeah. A lot of the films of this era make it as if adults just can't tune into that world. It's like the films where adults don't believe in Santa, but all the kids believe in Santa. Yeah. It's like that that distinction between it's the two of them. very much a Spielberg thing that the adults don't get it. Mm. Yeah. Yep. So earlier I mentioned the fact that she leaves Elliot at home and I was like, eh, that's a bit questionable. She leaves Gertie at home by herself. I'd agree with that. That's bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When Elliot was sick, we were like, yeah, she doesn't really have many options. Why doesn't she just take Gertie with her? <laughs> it doesn't Someone's got to clean up the beer cans. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, fair, yeah, yeah, fair. So now that she's taught 
E.T. how to speak, we get the iconic E.T. phone home line. Mm. So we know what he's trying to do. So, I mean, we knew that he'd been left behind at the start, but Elliot was unaware that that's why he was around. And so they're starting to communicate and he realizes he wants to get back home. So he needs to have some sort of method to contact them so they can come back and pick him up. Yeah. But we also find out that he can heal because whilst Elliot is making the communication device, he cuts himself and E.T. touches it and fixes the cut. Now, I don't know if we need this. No, I don't think it serves any other purpose and in fact kind of becomes contrary later on exactly what i was thinking so the telekinesis i get it they establish it early on with some little things so that they can have the bikes flying later on but no one ever gets hurt later on and then healed using this power when et and elliot both are communally ill they don't use any sort of healing power to fix each other Mm. it just it seems like an odd thing to have included in the film if nothing else it helps with the gag later on where they are doing the photo of um, the Halloween and then Michael has the fake knife through the head and, oh, yeah. and E.T.'s and just, trying to heal ow, it. Ow. Ow. He's like, it's so fake, good. it's fake. I, I like that gag, but like outside of that, it doesn't really serve a purpose. Agreed. <laughs> Speaking of that scene, when they try to go trick-or-treating, uh, did you hear in the background what Michael had planned to go to Halloween as? Uh, I did. Mary says, no, you can't go as a... Terrorist, she terrorist, says. That's you can't right. go as a terrorist. Yeah. And then as soon as we see him in the next scene, he's quite clearly wearing the outfit that he was intending to wear, just with a bowler hat yeah. on top of it. <laughs> I really like Mary in this scene. She's dressed in full costume for Halloween. Yeah. This is what I'm going to be like if I become a And parent. the doting mum vibe to it as well. We've got to take photos. Yeah, take you photos all look so cute. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I really yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. E.T. in a sheet as a ghost might be cuter than E.T., in general. Yes. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. I, I really like that. I I like their strategy for smuggling him out of the house. And I like that they do a random cutaway to Gertie, also dressed like a ghost, just like hanging out. <laughs> just like waiting to come back. I love how square E.T.'s body looks under that sheet and that like Mary doesn't question it all, at all. Nah. Gertie, why are you so square? square? <laughs> the other cool thing about him wearing the ghost outfit is... We do get his point of view shots out in the street and you get it through the sheet holes. Very well done. I love yeah. that. Um, and when he sees uh, the kid in the Yoda costume and he like thinks it's a friend of his, like, <laughs> I love that. It's great. Halloween is when the faceless men rock up to their house. Yes. Yeah. So I, I, um, I think it's kind of poignant that these men have been a threat for a couple of days at least, mm. but it's on Halloween that they arrive. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And this is... They're not there to confront them at this point. They just do like a sneaky look around. Yeah. Thematically, it just it just fits that it's ominous and it's Halloween. And yeah, there's this sunset shot. And I was like, this feels like something straight out of Indiana Jones <laughs> walking off into it. Spielberg uses a lot of warm colors mm. whenever E.T.'s in a scene. When Michael and Gertie first meet E.T. in the wardrobe, you notice that's really warm as well. Yes. Yeah. And it contrasts so well with like any time the government agents are around, they're like blues and cool colors. Yeah, absolutely. And- yep. When Elliot rides his bike with E.T. and he goes off the cliff, all I could think of was Mac and me. <laughs> So, so good. Uh, so, for anyone who hasn't seen Mac and Me, you need to check out uh, the sequence. Just write Mac and Me Cliff on YouTube. It is a very, very funny clip from the film. <laughs> so good. It was an alternate suggestion to E.T. for Film Club this week, actually. Mm. We get the iconic moon shot where, as he's riding the bike, he goes past the moon and it ended up becoming the Ambling Entertainment logo, yep. which is Steven Spielberg's company. Yep. At this point, E.T. does, in fact, phone home. Yes, it worked. It worked. It did work. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And they all celebrate by having a nap. (laughs) It worked. Go home. But no, they stay out there all night and Elliot falls asleep. And then uh, after his little snooze, he wakes up and E.T.'s gone. You you snooze, you lose, (laughs) E.T. It's quite sad when he wakes up and he can't find him. Yeah, um, and then this is uh, at the same time that the government arrives. Like, in- Well, so I don't know how they tracked them back to his house. Through the Skittles? <laughs> yeah, it must through the, the Reese's Skittles. Pieces? <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. But then suddenly, like, the spacemen are coming through. Uh, I look- so this is... Very exaggerated. This I is very, really don't like it. No, I didn't like it. It was a bit on the nose, but 
child's perspective? Like, are we meant to see it as something kind of not quite realistic? Because oh, that, I don't know why. They could have gone for, like, hazmat suits. Well, the, the ones that start marching up the road aren't in full spaceman suits. No. They're just in more hazmat. Yeah, but um, I don't understand why they're in full astronaut gear. And, like, as if they would enter a house like that. It doesn't Where make one any comes sense. in the door... Then another comes through the back door. One comes through the window. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I uh, really don't like it. Yeah, um, I, I, I did find it a bit off-putting. Yeah, I did notice in this sequence though. We know Key Man's back. We don't see the keys this time, but we just hear a little jingle jangle <laughs> as they're going through. This is because Michael has to go out and find. Yeah, Elliot. This Elliot sends the, Michael off. This is yeah. the first time where I was like, all right, I can get behind Michael now. Like, oh, okay. He's, yep. he's he's being more heroic, and he goes and he finds ET, and he's that sickly white. Yep. Um and because E.T. is sick, obviously that means Elliot is sick too. That, like, as a child, I remember being very upset to see a sickly looking E.T. Like, if you've got half a heart, you're in love with E.T. So to find him near death, pale white, like, it's pretty scary stuff, like, to think, like, how sick he is. Well, yeah, I hadn't remembered any of the part where they were sick. Mm. Um, I basically went from the bizarre classroom to the end of the film. Yeah. I couldn't really remember what happened in between them. So, yeah, it was still confronting for me last night watching it. I yep. felt really bad for him. Yeah. But, yes, the astronauts arrive and they just jump straight into it. This was another thing. Like, I know you're a big fan of Mary, but she doesn't seem to protest much. That her just house like, just gets taken over. Yeah, and, and, becomes... and her kid gets, like, <laughs> she basically doesn't see Elliot after this point until after E.T. is presumed oh, dead. She just we're, comes back again. We've got the events because E.T. was upstairs with the kids mm -hmm. and she goes and takes them away, sends Michael and Gertie off and then picks up Elliot. But yeah, then everything kind of, we see a uh, hubbub of like machinery coming to the mm. house. I like that shot where they're sort of walking into town all in the line. Yes, that's, that's very cool. ominous. Yeah. yeah. Um, the very rapid decline of both E.T. and Elliot. Yeah, and um, we finally see Key Man's face. Yes. Um, it was well worth the wait. <laughs> he chats to Elliot, and I really like this moment. You think he's this ominous character, and then he says something really, really nice to Elliot. He says, number one, that even since he was 10 years old, he had hoped to come across something like this. But then he says, I'm really glad he found you first. Mm. Like, it's, it's a really sweet moment. It gives the film a lot of heart. The other government guys are asking Michael all those questions. And he's like, oh, so uh, does Elliot think his thoughts? And he's like, no, Elliot feels his feelings. Like, you idiot. <laughs> I mean, he kind of does both, right? Yeah that, yeah. that scene earlier was very ambiguous how they're linked. Yes. Both E.T. and Elliot get separated from the rest of the family. But we get this really nice moment where it shows Michael quite somber and sad, and he goes into the cupboard. That's a really nice moment. Yeah, and kind of re um, reverts back to being a child who's, like, overwhelmed by the circumstance, for mm. sure. Yep. It's quite a confronting scene because they're, like, poking and prodding at E.T. And Elliot even says, I think this is the second time he says, I'll be right here. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, just like, I'm here for you, buddy. It builds really, really quickly, and it gets to a point where, as he's starting to get really ill and you know, like, he's going to die... Elliot's yelling, you're killing him, you're killing him. And all the kids in this scene, like it cuts to Gertie and she's crying. Michael screams out as he sees like the flower wilt. All of the kids are really bringing it at this point. Yep, for sure. Really, really powerful. On top of that, this scene where they are trying to, like the, the medical staff are trying to save E.T. A bit of trivia is that um, these are legitimate medical staff that um, Spielberg oh. brought in and said, act exactly like you would as if you had a human on the table. I do feel there's a sincerity in this scene. Okay, yeah. The, the way that they're responding to the emergency. Speaking of responding to the emergency, it cuts to the kids on bikes outside yeah. and they say, something's happening. Something's <laughs> definitely happening. Of course something's happening. There's government trucks everywhere. There's big like hazmat tents over the top of the house. It, it, I do understand though that that, we, the audience, knowing that the kids are there, comes into play later on when Michael pulls up in the van and stuff like that. But they didn't have to say that line. That's true. I do think it speaks to kids just, like, needing to have their two cents. Yeah. This is the last time I'm going to mention uh, 
key man jingle jangling okay. <laughs> even even when he's in the hazmat suit as he walks you could hear the jingling i had not picked up to it's this extent, so like, funny <laughs> to, uh, the, to the point where it's off-putting for you like the fact that you're yeah, yeah right did, okay at that point i hadn't noticed it doesn't add anything we're going to assume he's with that group and then once they've already established the character they no longer need to rely on the keys to identify See, like, so interesting, like, obviously that's, you've got a very um, astute kind of media critical eye. I missed it and I was probably caught in with their intent. Yeah. Like, I didn't notice it. You were probably paying attention to E.T. dying at this point. Yeah. 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 That's fair. That's totally fair. But that's what I'm saying. It just detracts from that. Yeah. They assume E.T. is dead and they pack him up to take him away, but they give Elliot a moment to chat to him. I love this scene. It's a really, really sweet moment. And as soon as he finishes talking to him, we get like the glowing on his chest mm-hmm. and then the flower comes back to life. Yep. And it's like, yep. ah. Oh, I'm tearing up thinking about it now. I certainly teared up when it came on the screen the other day. So yeah, you yeah. tear up more so that he's alive than yeah, like, when he dies. Yeah, yeah, abs- well, both, I think, but like more so when like uh, Elliot's realisation that this person he loves so much, or well, thing that he loves so much, is not dead after all. Like, yeah, the, yeah, the relief, I feel that. Yeah. You are yeah. genuinely getting a yeah, little yeah, glassy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it, it was legitimate. Like, and I think a lot of it's to do with Elliot's delivery. Like, yeah. I, like, like, what was the actor's name? Henry Thomas. Henry Thomas. I reckon he delivers the goods. He does. Yeah. Very yeah. much so. Um, in, in the sad sequence, once he's happy again that E.T.'s alive, both his reaction and Michael's reaction where he jumps up and hits his head. Those ones for me, I'm like, it was an odd choice. I wanted to ask you this. Uh, I think I already know the answer, but Elliot mm-hmm. versus the boy in Jurassic Park. Wait, who do I like more? Yeah, yeah. Because I, I, I feel like you had mixed feelings for, what's it, is that Michael in Jurassic Park? Is that the name Tim? of it? Tim? You might be right with Tim. I like... And we don't even know if this is his name. I think I like Tim more. I, I feel... Oh, no, okay. I did not expect that. No, because remember... It is Tim. Remember I originally said Tim starts off and he's presented as annoying in the film, but I really like it. Oh, okay. I like yeah. how he's a little irritating to Grant at first. Yeah. And then I like all the sarcastic comments he says about his sister. Oh, I know it's his sister you yeah. didn't like so much. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yep. Yeah. okay. Oh, great. Now she'll never try anything new. I really like Elliot too, like, and I think, as as I said, I think he does a really good job. And then obviously we have the big sequence. They steal the car. He only knows how to drive it in reverse, though, so it's a bit of a it's a bit of a hubbub. <laughs> well, he thought he was going to have more time, but then he got caught in the driver's seat. That's he true. He thought he was going to be able to read the manual on how to drive a car, <laughs> which thought- they always just keep. In <laughs> yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. But he says to the kids, meet us at the playground at the top of the hill. And they go, let's do it. Yeah. And they all put their glasses <laughs> and hats on. That. It's so much fun. Uh, um, but I don't know why he chose the playground at the top of the hill. Because in the very next scene, Michael doesn't know how to get to the playground at the top of the hill. Probably should have picked a location where he knew how to get there. He knows how to get there on a bike where he gets to cut through like different, like maybe just not via road. Right, yeah. I see. As, a, as to the bike flies, he knows how to get where there. Where they're going, they don't need roads. <laughs> Um, but yes, this is good. This is the uh, yeah, as you said, not just an iconic scene, but again one that is very uh, Stranger Things adjacent. Yes. Just before they start cutting through the um, the development, development yeah, 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 the real estate. Yeah. yeah. Elliot goes, follow me, and all I could think was, follow me, while I turn into a much older stunt person and ride through <laughs> this. Like all the wide shots, you can tell he's just a completely different person. Right, yep, yep. More often than not, that's very easy to overlook, but I found it quite obvious in this in particular because Elliot's so small, and when they're getting a stunt person, they were probably getting someone significantly older <laughs> yeah. to do it. They kind of get through and uh, see Thomas Howell's character. I can't remember what his name is, but he says, we made it. And then immediately a giant swarm of people yeah. come. <laughs> if he wasn't wearing that balaclava, maybe his peripheral vision might have been a little bit better. Yes. But this was one of the things. So as they're going up, just before they start flying, you see the cop barricade. I believe this was one of the things that they changed with visual effects when they redid it. All the cops are holding shotguns. Yes. But in the alternate version, because I watched a couple of clips, it looks like they're holding walkie-talkies instead. So they actually took the guns out. I'm glad Spielberg reverted and said, no, no, no. Let's just keep it the way I made it. Yeah. Yeah. But yes, as you mentioned earlier, the bike shots look quite comically dated. Yes. What I thought was even funnier than that, the acting in the close-up shots. 
<laughs> for yeah. some of the friends. Yeah. They're just like, they've cranked it up to 11. Cle- it's so clear- funny. Clearly that they've just like put the camera above the shoulders. Yeah. And just to say, all right, now say wall. Yeah. <laughs> Pre- wall. Pretend you're off the ground. But some of them, it's like halfway through the scene. So they've already been flying for a long time. And then it like cuts to them and they're like, oh my God. Like, it's just, it's too much. Something to point out though, is that these kids, when it is the full body shot, they <laughs> were put onto a crane in front of a green screen. So obviously they oh. may have only been a couple of feet off the ground, not a hundred feet off the ground, but they were legitimately raised off the ground and then superimposed onto would the image. Would it have been green screen? Uh, I don't know like what the tech matte, would, yeah. Kind of, I feel like black screen kind I, of, I, I don't know. I don't know the history well enough, but like I said to you, it didn't look too dissimilar to what um, they did in Mary Poppins for that kind of technology. And but that was like matte paintings in actually yeah, like, like it's Yeah, like it's, only, it's less than 20 years later Mm. Um, so I don't feel like the technology had updated. Maybe to maybe green screen wasn't a thing then. Yeah. Well, it, it probably some form of chroma keying because you can see it looks like the bikes are really thin. Like yeah. the the edges have been like feathered in too much. Yep. You overlook that stuff. That's what they were. Yep. They get to a point where it's like they got away and no one can find them except all the main characters that need to be there at the end of the film. (laughs) Um, Like Mary arrives with Key Man. I feel like they should have had a separate side plot. Oh, right. That's that's Mary's new love interest. Maybe in the uh, 40th edition release, they'll have their own extra scenes where they're together. And that Harrison Ford headmaster scene. Maybe Mary and Harrison Ford hit it up. Yes. It's a a brand new film. It'll breathe some new life into it. (laughs) I, I... find the the end part really really sweet and we get the final i'll be right here i had always remembered him saying i'll be right here and pointing to his heart but he points to his head i feel like it would have been more touching if he pointed to his heart agree yeah, yeah. Because, and especially like they set up et and his mates as like having these glowing hearts so the idea of them he's lads yeah, so. yeah, he's lads, he's boss. Uh, yeah, um, you know, th- th- it is set up that they, these characters do have the equivalent of warm hearts, mm. like symbolically warm hearts. So, yeah, pointing at that would have been... Anyway, we'll give Spielberg those notes, maybe. Yeah, he'll superimpose it in. For the, for the 40th yeah, edition. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then E.T. gets on his ship and heads back to Legoland. <laughs> uh, I love this. Wrap up. That's the end of the film. No epilogue where we need to know how Elliot's gone six months later. Well, I, I don't want to know about the romance between Mary and King Man. <laughs> I've made it quite clear that I love a quick wrap up at the end of a film. And this film did very well to go. This is where we'll cut. Yeah. I, I loved that. Like it, it's, a, it's a sweet ending. The resolution's there, but we don't need to know how Elliot's going afterwards. Mm. Yeah, that, That's very true. Mm. Off the top of my head, I can't remember where I ranked this in my list of Spielberg films. But what I will do, uh, with your permission, of course, I will copy our letterbox accounts in the description yeah. below the video. Yep. And then people can go check it out if they want to. And add us on letterbox as well. Like, yeah. you know, I'm, like and on top of pressing subscribe and like and all the things on YouTube, yeah, hit those letterbox links and... Um, yeah, we'll share lists and what we've watched and all that. Yeah, things. I'm not one for um, staying up to date with any time I no, see a movie, no, yeah, yeah. but I make a lot of lists. Oh, I'm going to rank these series. Yep. I'm talking about it. Uh, like, it's good fun. Whatever level you're using Letterbox at, Letterbox is a bit of fun. Yeah, yeah. oh, for sure. Yep. Shall we move on? Yeah. To Weekly Watches. Weekly, 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 weekly watches. Weekly, 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 weekly watches. At I've got two movies, one TV show, and two games to talk about today. Oh, so, someone's got a PS5 in yes, there. So yes, yes. It's yeah. not mine. No, it's not mine. Yeah. And you know, I've said this many times before, I'm not much of a gamer, but Maddie loves games. And she also really likes it when I play games. I, I'm, I've never been one to sort of sit and watch someone else play a game, but she loves that. I think it's like watching a, you play. Yeah, I Ooh. think it's like a nostalgia thing, I think, because her and her sister used to play right, a lot okay. when they were growing up, yep. um, which I kind of did. I'd watch my brother play, but I wouldn't do that now. I'm, I'm the same. I haven't owned a console since a Wii. Mm. Um, and um, I really had never gotten into it much beyond Mario Kart. But I remember when you used to play games on the old systems and it was one where it was only one player, you used to take it in turns yeah. and watch your friend or your brother um, play. Yeah, so I used to do the same. 
The first one that I played was The Last of Us. So you know that I've been really keen to play this because I loved the TV series mm -hmm. and I just really wanted to see how closely it resembled it. And it's amazing because it has interactive elements and it, it does at times feel like an adventure game that you're going through, but it's so cinematic. Yeah, like right. There's lots of cut scenes. There's lots of times where you're just wandering around and just looking at the world around you. It's, it's very cool. I think you'd enjoy it just because I know how much you liked the TV series as well. I think you'd enjoy the experience of it. Yeah. So I haven't played too far into that because, as I said, I don't really game a whole lot. But the other one was Maddie was playing Tomb Raider and it just looked like a fun kind of adventure type game. And I was doing marking in the other room. And anytime I took a break from marking, I would come out. And she'd be like, all right, jump in, kill some bad guys. And then I would go back to is my Is this market. like a recent version of Tomb Raider or like, because I know Tomb Raider is like late 90s, the original came Yeah, out. no, 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 no. Yeah. It's, it's a one for the PS5, I right. believe. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or at the very least, the PS4. And yeah. they've kind of brought out another version of it. Good fun. Like, and it was just a nice, different break from sitting down and watching an episode of something. Well... Coincidentally, uh, I'm like I said, I'm even less of a gamer. I don't have a console in my house currently. But the last two weekends, I have been around at a friend's house. They have a Nintendo Switch, mm. and we've been playing the latest version of Mortal Kombat, ah, uh, yes. which uh, has a bunch of nostalgia for me. But this one came out in 2019, so pretty modern. And yeah, that's been good fun as well. Like, just, yeah. you know, fighting. It's just cathartic. Fighting. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, in terms of movies, let's talk one that we are both talking about. <laughs> That's the uh, best version of the Mission Impossible theme, Mission Impossible 2, Electric Boogaloo. <laughs> uh, anyone who listened to the podcast last week knows that I saw Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1, mm -hmm. and I also saw Talk to Me back-to-back uh, -back at um, the cinema, but I couldn't talk in detail about these films because Mr. Brown hadn't seen them. Still haven't seen Talk To Me, but you have seen Mission Impossible. Exactly. So we can finally discuss what we're reckoning about it. <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. We I both also loved it. I loved it. Uh, we both have it ranked third. Yes. In terms of uh, the list. We, we draw a very clear divide between number two and the rest of the franchise. I think the franchise is maybe one of the strongest franchises ever. In terms of consistency. Consistency, yeah. yeah, yeah. For like sure. two is the only one where I'm like, mm, yeah, they, they didn't quite hit the mark on that. Most one. people who have seen the film say the same thing. I don't mm. think anyone says, oh, I like this one and this one, but the rest are crap. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, Mr. Crook the other day, I was talking to him. He goes, I love all of them. Like, mm. you know, he, he's a big fan of them as well. Ethan, we know. Ethan, we know. Ethan was... recently watched four, five, and six, and then he wrote very detailed notes and, and handed them over to Mr. Whittle and <sighs> had I. A, had a lot of fun reading them today. Yes. But yeah, uh, Dead Reckoning, absolute win. Um, no spoilers, I guess, but like, yeah, um, really recommend. You, you spoke about it, even though it's um, Macquarie's third film in the franchise, mm -hmm. he did five, six, this one, and then he'll be doing the last one as well. Yep. It is a bit of a tonal shift. It's very, very different, yeah, I thought. Yeah. And it was very refreshing because the last few have felt quite similar yeah. in tone. So it was nice to get something a little darker. Mm -hmm. It also, for me, this one is the closest to the original film in terms of tone. That sense of paranoia. Yeah. Um, it felt more like a, a spy film rather than an action film. And it just felt very tense. The entire time you are sort of on the edge of your seat wondering what's going to happen next. So no duds in the cast. No, the whole very cast strong cast. Strong. And also times where it almost felt like a horror film, mm -hmm. like terrifying sequences. So I, I reckon they did an amazing job with it. Yeah, certainly one of my favorites. And like you said today, excited to rewatch it. Like we'll mm. yeah, go back and probably appreciate it even more. So yeah, winner for both of us, Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. Yes, another one that we've both ranked on Letterboxd as well, if people want to go check out Absolutely. our ordering. yes. Other movie for me was Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Oh, we haven't talked that one. So no. I saw it at the cinema about a month ago now, whenever it was out. Yeah, and I wanted to see it at the cinema about a month ago. Does that count for anything? Uh, sure. <laughs> uh, but it's taken me this long to get around to it. Unfortunately, by the time I had a spare moment to go see it, it was off at the cinema. So I've been waiting very, very patiently for it to come on to Disney+. Plus. Mm -hmm. And I even said to you late last week, yes. oh, I really want to go home and watch Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. I hope it's on Disney+. Plus. 
and I'm pretty sure it came out that day. Nice. So, yeah, I loved it. I oh, really good. really loved it. Good. I thought it was a blast as well. Some really sad moments in it. Yeah, they um, did pretty, like, they, they went in for some easy heartstring pulls, but that's it, true. it worked. Yeah, yeah for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. And I like, obviously, the fact that it's more rocket focused. Yeah. It was really good. I was a little worried too because did you watch the the Christmas special? No, that that I haven't seen. I wasn't. I, I'd be interested to get your thoughts on it. I wasn't a fan of that, which I'm sure is very shocking to you because it features one Kevin Bacon, oh, okay. um, who I adore. Mm. But it's centered on Mantis and Drax, who are characters I really like. I feel like in this movie, number three, they steal the show. Their interactions are my favorite. Uh, agreed. Yeah, I, yeah. I thought they did a fantastic job in the third film, but I was worried after the Christmas special because they are the main characters in that, I feel like they work better as side characters uh -huh. so that every time you hear a line from them, you think, oh, that's great. That's hilarious. But if they become the central focus, it's almost like overkill. I'd probably agree with you. I mean, I haven't seen the Christmas special to confirm that, but yeah, I, I certainly like where they sit within the group, but there's so many good characters in number three. Oh, it's really, really <laughs> good. Three. I did say the Adam Warlock character felt relatively useless. Yes. Um, um, they'd done a lot of marketing to be like, he's going to be in it. And then it's kind of like, yeah, but what does he actually bring to the Agreed. Table? Yep. Yep. Nothing to do with his performance. He was, he was amusing in it. He would have had to get super buff for quite a pointless character though. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. He just felt a little tacked on. Yeah. So Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, a very strong trilogy. What universe does the X-Men sit in in comparison to Guardians and all the other universes that I'm meant uh, to know of now? Well, Are they they're, connected? they're Marvel, but yeah. at this point, they're not connected to the Marvel Cinematic At universe. this point, but, you know, wait a couple of years and they'll find another five, ten movies to make about oh, they, it. They absolutely will. Like they've, <laughs> they've only recently been bought by Disney right. to allow them to be able to do it. Ah, okay. Um, so that's the thing. So for so long, they couldn't even say terms like mutants in MCU because they didn't have the rights to it. It's uh -huh. the same with, like, Deadpool and Fantastic Four, but now they own all of those. So my understanding is that Deadpool, Fantastic Four, and X-Men are kind of in that same, they're in the same world, yeah? Oh, well, Deadpool is an, is an X-Men character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The reason I bring it up is uh, one of my weekly watches was Logan. Oh, nice. Yeah, um, and this was a rewatch for me, 2017's Logan. Remember loving it at the time, and I loved it again. I don't tend to go into too many of the superhero films in terms of what's out there, but I certainly love the X-Men franchise. You and I and Javier spoke about it on Friday at Film yeah, Club. Yeah. Um, yeah, and Logan's an absolute win for me in terms of the grittiness of mm. it. This is obviously the third Wolverine film that they put out. Yeah, probably the only good X -Men one. X-Men Origins, the Wolverine, and then this one. And mm. yeah, I would agree that this is the, the, the good one. Yeah, because um, he shines in the X-Men films, but his own films were never really yeah, that good. But yeah. Logan, I agree, is, is fantastic. But I also like Stephen Merchant's character in this. Um, That's true. I forget what he's called. He's like a tracker. Mm. Yeah, that, so they call him Mutie as a derogatory nickname, but like he's actually got, um, got a different name. Javier, what's his name? Put it in the comments. And then Patrick Stewart in as well. So Logan's a win for me. A couple of other films for me, I'll just reel them off because I don't think anyone listening to this podcast is really going to check them out. <laughs> uh, sorry, maybe Ethan will. Um, to Leslie, which is a film that came out last year. It's a bit of a realism drama that I really liked. Uh, Andrea Riseborough plays the main character in it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm boring him before I even finish the list. He's yawning at me. Um, yeah, and then two films from Yorgos Latimos, who is a name that I've mentioned on this podcast a couple of times because he's got a new film coming out later this year called Poor Things, mm -hmm. although it seems like it's been pushed because of the writer's strike, maybe into early next year. But I'm checking out his back catalogue, so I watched his first two films, Dogtooth and Alps. Both are Greek films, so they were subtitled. And they're also early films for him. So you kind of see him forming his look, but it's not quite as engaging as some of his later films. So, yeah, that was the other three that I watched. Uh, my last one, TV show, I've been revisiting Mythbusters. Oh, yes. It's just an easy watch. Mm -hmm. Like, it's a good one to have on if you're plodding around the house doing little jobs and things like that. But it's also, for me, it's really nice. Like, if I'm quite tired and I want to just zone out a little bit in front of the TV... It's, it's a fun one to watch too. Like the characters are just having a blast. And I would have seen maybe half of Mythbusters in total. Like there was a time where I would 
diligently watch it when it was on TV. So for the ones I haven't, it's really interesting. Yeah, like, right. The, the facts and, and science behind a lot of them are really cool. And because they do a bit of a mix of more obscure myths and everyday things that people always say, there's quite a lot that's you just assume is real that's disproven on the show too. So... Yeah, like it, it's a lot of fun. And I know, especially in the later seasons, they do a lot of like movie myths as well. Okay. Like things that you see all the time in movies, like, oh, if you shoot a car's gas tank, then the whole car will blow up, things like that. It's fun to be able to see things you recognize around as well. Yeah, check out Mythbusters. I, I don't know what I'm, maybe I'm watching on Prime. I think it's free on Prime. I will mention one TV show, season three just started up two weeks ago. I absolutely adore this show. It's called How To with John Wilson. So John Wilson is a New York documentarian. He gets to make these little half hour episodes for HBO where he has a topic, but he assembles all this random footage that he's taken just of people on the streets to tell the story of his topic. You would love this, I think. I'm going to just have one episode and see how you go. Um, But yeah, I adore... Just the way he makes these um, episodes and they're just so heartwarming but interesting and because it's like an assembly piece, it's like the the way he puts it together is intriguing. So yeah, that's How To with John Wilson. I really like the show. Yeah, That's it for me for Weekly Watches. Uh, Before we jump into our next segment, I very quickly want to talk code words. Did you miss our code words for last week? We didn't have one. <laughs> I was going to say, I missed it because I don't think we had one. No, no. I I think uh, code words are going to go the way of the dodo. I feel like it was a, a term one and a term two thing um, just to kind of get people a little more engaged. A bit of a ploy to get people listening. But I did want to just shout out to listeners. If you did keep track of those and you've uh, you've been following along. I'll mention this this week and I'll mention it again next week. Perhaps we'll do a reveal the, the following week after that. If you come and you talk to Mr. Whittle and I, and you can list as many code words as possible, whoever has the most code words that they have retained from the podcast, I reckon we could do an episode where our title image for the episode is a brand new photoshopped poster of one of the podcasts that we've done. They can pick whichever one. And we will Photoshop all three of our faces in. That's cool. The most code words. So you've got two, three weeks now. Go back, have a listen to all the podcasts. See if you can identify those code words. And whoever can come to us with the most listed, we will uh, Photoshop that in and put it into an episode in what a few a prize. Weeks time. I love it. Yeah, very good. It felt very on brand for us to do a, a prize in that vein. Agreed. Alrighty, moving on to tantalizing trailers. Trailers, Don't know if we will be a fan. How will it be? We'll know in time. Do you want to kick things off for tantalizing trailers? <laughs> sure. I have none that are new. Ah, and great. the only one that I've got to really stir you up with is I rewatched, well, I watched the final one of... It's going to be June. It is June. Yeah. yeah. So they've done the final trailer for Dune. 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 (laughs) Dune part two. Uh, (laughs) Dune two. Dune two. Starring Florence (laughs) Pierre. That's going to be a thing. We're going to see how many names we can do with that. Uh, That's like the Californians kind of vibe, isn't it? Yeah. (laughs) What are you doing here? (laughs) They did release the final preview for Dune 2 I was already excited and I am champion at the bit for this one uh, oh, look, I, I'm, I'm still I might go back and rewatch Dune as I've always said I wasn't a huge fan of it however the fact that I fell asleep in Dune had nothing to do with how boring it was it still was a bit boring for me but I was also very tired and that would have completely changed my perception of it I believe so I do want to revisit it. I feel like I also need to go and watch Avatar for Jave. Maybe while I'm at it, I'll watch Promare for Kai. I'm doing the rounds at the moment. You do all those, and I'll go watch one of the Barbie films for Daria. Will you really? If you watch Dan 1, I'll watch one of the Barbie films. Not wow. one of the 80 that there are, but yeah. You know what's great about that? Daria also thinks June is super boring, so <laughs> it, it emphasizes how much more of a sacrifice that is for me. 
just to do that for her. Yeah. Uh, only trailer I watched in the last week was uh, Dune 2. Dune 2. Cool. Well, then I will race through mine. My first one. Dicks, the musical. I take back what I said. I also saw that trailer. Okay, great. Um, so A24 are doing a musical and it looks great. It looks so stupid. Yep. The thing that made me the happiest in it is that it's going to have Nathan Lane in it. Yes. I, I love Nathan Lane so much. Yep. Musical alumni. Just seems like it's about two arrogant assholes, mm-hmm. and the songs are all obviously heavily comedic and wildly inappropriate. Yes, I'm sure I'll be uh, seeing that one. I don't know if it's is it getting a, a streaming release? Is it at the cinemas? What's I haven't seen it coming soon at any of the cinemas that I kind of check what they're going to be releasing. I so don't know that I'd be going to the cinemas. To I watch don't it anyway. know if it'll be one that gets a, a cinematic release here. I think it'll be straight to stream. Yeah, right. Yeah, yep. Um, but I'll I'll definitely check it out. Mm. And the final one for me, this is one that has been out for a very long time, but it's getting a 10th anniversary edition. Sharknado. Have you heard of the Sharknado Yeah, I've heard of it. I've not seen it. I've seen just the first one. That was enough for me. But it's getting a a fully remastered version re-released. It's also being re-released in cinemas. Oh, oh wow. well, actually, not even re-released because the original wouldn't have been released in cinemas. Yeah, it's got a massive cult following. I don't know what number they're up to now, but they've done like a Sharknado in space. It's ridiculous, <laughs> um, and it's a tornado that sweeps into a town. It brings with it a bunch of sharks, but also sucks up a bunch of water. So the whole town gets flooded, and then sharks are everywhere. <laughs> um, and it's. It's very amusing. The effects look like something that would be like a Snapchat filter. Yeah. Yeah, so really shoddy effects, but very amusing. The kind of thing that you would watch so that you and your friends could laugh at how terrible it was. And it knows exactly what it is. And clearly it is very well received because it keeps getting funded to make sequel after sequel. Right. That's pretty much it. So, uh, as always, guys, we do really encourage you to like, subscribe, share around, comment. Go check out that short. Add us on Letterboxd as well. Yes. In the episode notes on YouTube, Mr. Brown will put our Letterboxd account links. Yeah, any yep. sort of support. We love that. Agreed. Uh, put giant billboards of us around. Advertise us in your parents. Give us a pile of post-it place. notes as to what you thought of a franchise. Oh, that one I love in particular. I was very happy to get those. Now, I know, guys, you must be very devastated that we do have to leave, but we'll be right here. <laughs> No good without the pointing to the head. It it doesn't work without the action. I could have done the ET voice, but I don't think that would have. Well, we point point to the laptop that we're recording the podcast on. I did point to it. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. we'll be right here. Bye, everyone. Thanks, guys.